Hoo ha too ha! Hello and welcome to Happy Harry's Hoo Ha 2 How To's 2. Blimey, uh, we're in sequel territory now, meaning that today's episode needs to be longer and more epic and bigger than the first, and needs to end with me telling you that I'm your father after having cut off your hand. But I won't do that yet, as you probably will need it for today. And before I jump into today's lesson, I'd like to give you guys a quick refresher on what this series is all about. What it isn't, or what it ain't, is a Flash animation only tutorial series. I am going to be using Flash, but only really as a tool to teach you lessons and techniques that I think will be applicable. Arguably, because I'm using Flash, I think this will be of more use to Flash animators, but I think there'll be maybe like a 70%, 30% split between 70% uh, pure animation methods and 30% Flash only technique. Now, uh, that having been said, I do have a few things to show you that I think I probably could have visited in more depth in the previous lesson that is Flash specific only, but then we're going to look at some real animation principles. So, I'll draw some wicked propaganda and we'll take a look at the eraser tool. And we're back with this absolutely heinous and offensive death to cheese or down with cheese sign. And because I bloody love cheese and it offends me so greatly to look at it, uh, let's get rid of it. Now, if we go over to the eraser tool here on the left hand side and double click, we can actually eliminate all of the art in the frame straight away. But we don't want to do that, so we'll hit Control Z or Control Z. And by selecting the thickness of the eraser tool, much like you would a brush, we can get a nice thick eraser here and get rid of it the old-fashioned way. Although, if that isn't good enough for you, uh, we can still use the arrow tool to actually highlight pieces of the art this way and click delete, as always, or press the delete key, rather. And uh, something that I also like to do is use the lasso tool located over here to actually freehand draw around pieces of art and get rid of them that way with the delete key. And there we have it, we've created the unforgettable anti-cheese slogan, EAF to cheese. Now another thing that I wanted to show you, if I get rid of that, is if you remember last week we looked at the classic tween tool. And by drawing a shape and selecting create classic tween, and then inserting a keyframe and moving the art on that keyframe, I was able to create all of the frames in between automatically. Of course, we don't just have to move things up and down and left and right. You can resize your art much like you would uh, with any art that you've drawn in Flash. And we can make it bigger and smaller and even rotate and even do crazy things like squash and stretch and change colors. And that is really pretty flipping exciting. Now, before we get on with today's lesson, there's one more thing I'd like to show you, which will become very useful today. And that is the onion skin tool. Now, onion skin is really Flash's way of mimicking drawing using pen and paper or pencil and paper in real life. And when you have all of your paper layered on top of a light box and the light is shining from underneath, you will be able to see uh, previous drawings that you've done or previous frames that you've drawn on the paper because the light is shining through. And I'll quickly show you what I mean by that. If we turn on this little box here labeled onion skin, you'll see these little gray boxes appear next to our cursor and we can drag them longer or shorter, either side, and that, because it's appearing in our timeline with our cursor, is effectively demonstrating how many frames before or after the current frame that we're on we will be able to see. Now, I just need one previous frame, and by dragging our cursor back to the beginning and starting to draw frames, you'll see by hitting forward and backward, incidentally, which is the more than or less than symbol on the keyboard, by hitting forward and backward, you will start to see that with every new frame, I see the ghost over here, the ghost of a previous frame, uh, which actually can be very useful in creating smooth animation that uh, doesn't sort of go too off model or too crazy because you are reined in by previous frames. So that's all very useful, but enough flash. I promised you universal animating techniques today, 
And I think it's time to finally look at those animation principles. Uh, <laughs> oh God, it just isn't funny anymore. Right, on with the lesson. Ladies and gentlemen, hobos and tramps, cross-eyed mosquitoes and bow-legged ants, I present for your delectation the amazing bouncing ball. There we have it. Bounce. Bounce. Now, if you've ever looked into learning animation before, maybe from an animation book or from another tutorial online, or you've checked out the Wikipedia article about animation, this may be a familiar sight to you, and there's a very good reason for that. The animation ball is, uh, or the animation bouncing ball rather, is a very tried and tested and proven true method for teaching people some very key aspects of animating movement. And I think it does that very effectively because it eliminates the need for complicated drawing and character design and things like that. Uh, it's nice to sort of be able to get rid of all that stuff and just look at movement. And it teaches us three important things. Sorry, I'm making it sound like a deity. It teaches us things. The holy bouncing ball of Antioch is able to teach us three important things. First of all, animating in arcs. Secondly, timing and spacing in animation and how the space between your drawings kind of creates pacing. And thirdly, the principle behind squash and stretch. And first of all, we're going to look at arcs. Not the kind that Noah built. Obviously, I'd be insane if I brought that up now. This is an animation tutorial. I have here a screenshot of every frame in that animated bouncing ball sequence which I showed you, all occupying the same screen at the same time. And it is a little bit like seeing in the fourth dimension, but at the same time it's very useful for seeing the literal arc that the ball is travelling in. And it illustrates in a very nice figurative way how the ball shoots up from being squashed down here. And uh, obviously gravity begins to take effect here and it goes back down to the earth. Now, I'm not necessarily interested in teaching you the effects of gravity and how to animate with realistic weight and physics just yet. Of course, that's a very important part of animating, but you might be animating something which takes place in space with a lack of gravity or underwater or something like that. However, animating in these arcs is still a really important part of giving readability and communicability, if that's even a word, to your animation and ultimately make it graceful and nice to look at. And I think I can illustrate that best by showing you what happens when you cock it right up. Oh dear. As you can see, we're having real trouble with our arc here and it's absolutely ruined our animation of the bouncing ball. Now if I turn off the animation layer for a moment and we look at again the image of all of the animation frames occupying the same screen at the same time we can see that it's basically next to impossible to try to plot an arc between those drawings. It's just absolute chaos. Now that doesn't work for a bouncing ball of course but it can work for other things and then it becomes timing which is the issue and I'll show you how in a moment. Okay I have here our old friend the bouncing ball this time the one that isn't drunk and as you may be able to see I have edited the drawing of the arc let's isolate that by drawing these little notches along the way and if I show you that screenshot again of all the frames at the same time you'll see that the notches fall about dead center with each drawing of the ball along the way. And that is very simple shorthand to show you basically how far apart each drawing is. We'll see that there are more drawings at the top of the arc and then at the bottom of the arc and again at the top here. And that is to create the illusion that the ball is slowest at the top of the arc and at the bottom of the arc. And it's quickest as it's falling to the ground here or shooting back up from having bounced off the ground. Now the way that we do that really is as I say spacing the drawings apart because timing and spacing are inseparable in animation. If every frame in your film takes up the exact same amount of time on screen it's the amount of drawings and the spacing between them which will create the illusion of timing and I can show you again what happens when we screw that up. 
Okay, so not quite the disaster that we had on our hands when we played around with the arc and ruined that, but instead, by messing around with the timing, we're left with a kind of laggy, herky, jerky looking animation that isn't very smooth or easy to look at, even though it has the exact same amount of drawings that we had originally, and it's still following that original arc. But I'm going to show you, with the placement of the notches along the arc, how we've sort of ruined that timing that we had originally. As you can see, there's no rhyme or reason to the placement of each drawing. Instead, we have drawings bunched together and then far apart, and then together and apart and together and apart, and there's no sort of smooth transition of moving slowly and then quickly and then slowly again. You can change direction, you can change speed, and you can change timing like that, uh, but as long as you chop and change radically, there's going to be no smooth transition available in your animation and you will get crappy looking timing, like so. Okay, what I'm doing here is using the onion skin tool and by animating frame by frame animation straight ahead, meaning I'm not doing any planning or any thumbnails or any roughs even, which is generally not really advised, I'm creating a very crude animation of a kite flapping around. Now I know what you're probably thinking, Harry, that don't look like no kite. And I will try to address that later. But for the moment, my only goal is to show you that with using even a completely random looking arc, by applying the rule of timing, by spacing the drawings closer together when you want the object to be moving slower, and by spacing the drawings further apart, when we want the object to be moving far quicker, we can still create quite a realistic illusion of movement, at least sort of this flighty kite movement, by just applying what we've learnt today in terms of timing. And this is beginning to drag, so I'll just have the kite flap away, move very fast because we're spacing the drawings out, and disappear. Okay, now I'm going to be slightly naughty and simply go to Modified Document and make the file playback at 12 frames a second. So effectively we're watching twos here, um, and that's just to save me the trouble of extending them all out and making them twice as long. And as you can see, we get a fairly serviceable kite animation. Now I know what you're thinking, again, Harry, it don't look like a kite. And I tell you, the first thing I do to address that is actually draw a little tail on the thing and then have the tail drag behind but that takes us to the third lesson from the bouncing ball which is the squash and stretch now here we are back with our friend the bouncing ball and he's going to teach us his third lesson of the day squash and stretch now, you might already have an idea of what that is, because it's probably the most literally named of the three techniques that we've looked at today. But what I'm going to do is turn off that animation and again look at this frame with all of the animation frames being shared at the same time on the same screen. And we can see here the actual shape of the ball sort of metamorphosizes as it begins to fall to the ground and pick up speed. And that's a result of it being sort of shaped by um, the gravity as it's falling. And as we see here, we have a very spherical shaped ball at the top when um, you know it's not really moving much. It's actually very static here at the top or comparatively static compared to how much it moves throughout the rest of the animation. And then as it begins to fall here, it gets sort of more um, elongated and stretched by the process of falling quickly. Now the reverse happens when it comes in contact with the ground and instead this very long thin ball hits the ground and flattens out before the reverse happens again and we get the long thin ball shoot off into the sky and eventually it regains its more spherical shape as it slows down. And it's really um, the object itself having stress put upon it through speed and gravity, which is shaping the object. And you see this happen in real life. Now, I know that the ball that we've animated here, well, to be honest, I animated it, but whatever. <laughs> the ball that we animated here looks like it's made of a soft rubber or maybe like a water balloon or something. But even a bowling ball or a golf ball or a ball carved from solid manliness 
uh, still squashes and stretches when it hits the ground. And if you doubt me, sire, check out any channel on YouTube that has high frame rate or slow-mo videos. And you can see that all these crazy things happen, like golf clubs warp weirdly in slow motion when they get hit against, you know, an iron girder or something. Or a, or a bullet will sort of flatten as it hits an object. This does happen in real life. It's just that our eyes don't pick up on it. But really, with animation, we're exaggerating real life and we're caricaturing real movement and you can get away with pushing and uh, stretching the limits beyond what you normally think you could get away with. Now another interesting way uh, for you to think about your squash and stretch is by dividing your objects into pieces. Now you know, don't need to draw dividing lines but I will just for the sake of demonstrating this idea. Let's say we have a ball that's split into uh, sort of individual chunks or pieces. When a foot comes in contact with the ball and kicks it really hard and gives it a good old whack, that ball is going to be flat at one end because it's uh, got this big crushing force here of the foot. But the uh, front part of the ball, this part, probably won't have caught up yet. And then only when the foot has actually left the ball completely will it begin to regain its shape. So we've got squash here and then stretch here as it begins to fly away from the foot and regain its shape. Because none of the pieces of any object or any person really are ever perfectly in sync. And that's something that I call... Um, the hierarchy of movement, I guess. I don't really call it that, but it sounds like a good name. The hierarchy of movement. Um, one thing is always somewhat in command of another thing and is sort of dragging it along for the ride. And by modding the bouncing ball, we can take a quick look at that in action. Now I know what you're thinking, you've had enough of this bouncing ball for today, but we're nearly through with him. He has one more purpose before we can cast him aside like an ex-girlfriend and never ever call him unless we're really drunk. Now we see him here, bouncing like he always does, predictable old bouncing ball. But I've modded him, uh, not to play PSP games unfortunately, but I've given him a little tail. And as you can see, the tail, like most tails probably do, um, doesn't have a mind of its own. It's basically being dragged by the force of the ball. And then, because of this, we get something that animators call overlap. And it's really not too different to the concept of squash and stretch, or the hierarchy of movement. There are pieces of our object that aren't really in control. The tail is not controlling the movement here. The ball... Again, it's an inanimate object, so it's probably not controlling anything. But the ball has the momentum, it has the weight, it is the driving force in the animation. The tail is sort of a leftover from that, and as we can see, the tail is basically just being dragged. And if we look at um, previous frames, you can see really it's just being forced to um, being tugged from the previous position that it occupied. And then when the ball begins to settle here... The tail finally settles as well, only to be dragged away again when the ball bounces back up into the sky. Now I think it's finally time to cast aside our bouncing balls, stop playing with our balls as it were, and look at how we can apply all of this crap that I've talked about today to actually animating characters. So here we have it, a genuine cartoon character. Took us long enough to get there, didn't it? And I know I'm not going to win any awards for character design here, but it's basically just a functional character here that I can animate quickly to show you guys how all of this stuff could be brought together so you can waste your life becoming an animator. And there we have it. A looping animation of this little baseball hat man throwing a ball. I don't know what kind of ball it is because A... I'm British, and B, I'm lazy, so I don't play sports, and I certainly don't play baseball. Um, but this animation here really does bring together a few things that we looked at today, and I'm going to break it down for you and show you exactly how that is. Remember when we looked at arcs today? Well, every single part of this character is making a journey on an arc. For example, if we look at just the hand isolated by itself here, you get an idea of the trajectory that it follows. Again, I've actually created a plot here and made notches for where each drawing falls to show you that the drawing, or the animation rather, of the hand with the ball does follow an arc. 
Okay, I stopped the arc at this point here, as you can tell. Um, but it would still make sense. We could still follow it down. And, and, and actually, let's edit that now, in fact, to make sure that that arc does follow the hand right until the very end. This is just to show you guys that the arcs themselves can be wacky, but as long as the spacing works, we still get a very satisfactory looking piece of animation. And as you can see, we ease in at the end here by adding lots of drawings that are very close together, and that gives that arc a very nice slow end. So that's the hand by itself. I've also done exactly the same thing for the head, and here's the head isolated by itself, and it kind of follows an arc and then goes back almost along the same arc. The head isn't that adventurous, it doesn't do quite as much movement as the hand, but that's really because the performance of this character, blimey let's get rid of all those arcs, they're confusing, the performance of this character is really driven by the hand, and if we talk about the hierarchy of movement, or the squash and stretch of the character, of which there isn't a whole lot, but if we at least look at his, uh, his sort of the order in which he's moving, we see really that this shoulder here drags this elbow, which drags the hand, and it's all sort of latent and dragging behind here, until finally the last thing to settle into position is the hand at the top. And again, it's that hierarchy of movement that I talked about. And again, you'll see on the peak of the cap of the character, when he goes down, the peak hasn't quite caught up yet, and is still moving down until the character begins to move up, and then it's forced to move up as well. It's because the cap does not have a mind of its own, so of course it's being dragged around by the character. And by combining all of those lessons, we've generated this very mediocre, basically stickman animation of someone playing a sport who clearly has no friends. No friends. So, join me next week where we'll begin to look specifically at character animation and learn all about how we can give our characters verve, vitality, and most of all, life. Unlike this guy. Only on Happy Harry's Who Hard 2 How To's. Bye bye! Happy Harry's Who Hard 2!